Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians Digital Conference session, All Women Have a Past, Reconstructing Women in the Historical Imagination. My name is Dan Hallett and I will be moderating this discussion. You can also find me as dhallett1692 on Reddit. All Women Have a Past explores the way women have been included and excluded in history by misrepresentations and gendered expectations. You'll hear about how queens and spies exerted their agency as women, and our speakers will address the ways that agency has been removed from our historical understanding and the process of restoring it. Before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep rooted and long lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our video description below. Our first speaker is Cassidy Percoco. She's the collections manager at the Fenmore Art Museum and the Farmers Museum. She's the author of Regency's Women Dress, Techniques and Patterns, 1800 to 1830. She'll be presenting her paper, Wicked Queens, The Afterlives of Isabeau of Bavaria, Catherine de Medici, and Marie, Marie Antoinette. I would like to acknowledge specifically that I'm speaking from the lands of the Oneoteaka people of the Haudenosaunee Nation. Historical queens are often viewed as paradoxes, powerful yet powerless, beneath the king yet wielding influence over him. In part because of this paradox, contemporary writers were able to depict them in whatever light they chose, resulting in skewed sources that plague both popular and often academic history afterward. In French history in particular, queens have been a tricky subject. Despite the fact that women were formally barred from the throne or from even passing along a place in the succession to their sons, there is ample evidence that during their lives, the exercise of power by queens was frequently seen as legitimate and appropriate. The same, however, cannot be said for how they were seen after death. The reality conflicted with the idealized image of a courtly, pious, and submissive queen, and they became convenient scapegoats for civil unrest that had real causes much more complex than illegitimate or incompetent rulership by a woman. Three French queens in particular have come to be seen as bywords for cruelty, lasciviousness, and inappropriate involvement in government arenas, Isabeau of Bavaria, Catherine de Medici, and Marie Antoinette. Louise Félicité de Caraglio, an academic and revolutionary, even published a polemic on Marie Antoinette in 1791, the crimes of the queens of France, that specifically compared her to these earlier queens, as well as others, to portray all of them as the worst ills befalling the country. At about 15, Isabeau of Bavaria married King Charles VI of France, himself only 17. Almost immediately, she became involved in court politics despite her youth, and in her 20s, she would be involved with papal politics and the choice of the next Holy Roman Emperor. Unfortunately, Charles was afflicted with a mental illness that prevented him at times from ruling. Over the course of several episodes, he entrusted more and more authority in Isabeau as a mediator and then co-regent with the Dauphin. During her time as a regent, Isabeau could not hope to solve the feud between two noble factions, the Armagnacs and the Burgundians. All she could do was keep it from overwhelming the country, already at war with England, until there was a strong adult king to put an end to it. She would switch sides as needed to keep what peace there was, supporting the Burgundians and then the Armagnacs. Finally, the Armagnacs took the opportunity to break up Isabeau's court on charges of immorality and imprison her. She was eventually rescued by the Burgundians and allied herself firmly with them. But the worst was yet to come. Henry V of England had conquered Normandy by 1419, and in 1420 he enlisted Isabeau's support for a peace treaty, the Treaty of Troyes, which required Henry to marry Isabeau's daughter and made him Charles's regent and heir, effectively disinheriting the Dauphin. While anger at the treaty was moderate at the time and largely based on factional issues, later generations saw it as a treacherous insult to France and an admission that the Dauphin was illegitimate and Isabeau therefore promiscuous. Isabeau's management of the two competing factions would be later portrayed as weak-minded vacillation, an inability to choose which was superior or a lack of the resolution needed to stay with one choice. The charge of immorality would also be taken extremely seriously with no regard for the context in which it had been leveled. As early as 1429, while she was still alive, 
There were rumors that she was an adulteress and the Dauphin not the king's son, possibly spread and then revived by the English, but it was also known throughout France. Historians of the 16th and 17th centuries, which saw queens regent and regnant becoming more common throughout Europe, used her supposed loose morals as well as her supposed incompetence to make their points about women's capabilities as rulers. Some would blacken her reputation further by making her vindictive and greedy for power, in addition to fickle and debauched. By the time Cavallio wrote her Crimes of the Queens of France, the notion of a sober and intelligent Isabeau had been long forgotten. Despite the fact that this was primarily a work about contemporary politics, it was then taken as a pattern for 19th and 20th century historians. As a relative of the Pope and a member of the powerful Medici family and with a massive promised dowry, Catherine was a sought after bride for royal houses in Western Europe. She and Henri, Duke of Orleans and second son of King Francois of France, married at 14 in 1533. Unfortunately, it was not immediately successful. She lost her dowry and then a few years later the Dauphin died, unexpectedly making Henri and Kathleen the next in line for the French throne. Henri's lack of interest in sleeping with Kathleen and her difficulties in conceiving led to her position becoming even more unstable. But he would die in 1559, leaving Kathleen regent over their eldest but still underage son, Francois. Kathleen's regency was extended by Francois's death and the accession of his younger brother, Charles, who allowed her to continue exercising power for him even after the regency technically ended. And its defining event, historically speaking, was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. Over the course of her tenure as both consort and regent, tensions between Catholics and Huguenots had increased. The Catholic Guise faction, aggravated by Kathleen's attempts to build bridges and find compromises between both sides, became more determined to stamp out Protestantism with violence. In the massacre, an assassination of a leading Huguenot figure by the Guises led the Catholic citizenry of Paris and its surrounding countryside to murder as many Protestants as it could find over the course of several days. The brutality was extreme, leading to a death toll in the thousands, even by modest estimates, and it would become the go-to example for Catholic cruelty toward Protestants for centuries. While there was no real peace after this, there were, however, no more massacres. The Guise brothers were finally murdered themselves, ending their faction's ability to cause conflict, and Kathleen died less than a month later. Despite the fact that Charles gave the order for the beginning of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and that Kathleen had spent years trying to find a way for the Catholic and Protestant parts of French society to coexist, the Queen Mother was seen by many as the leading, active figure, and therefore a cruel monster. Her long reign as regent and then advisor was also seen as suspicious. It suggested ambition, and ambition was an extremely unwelcome trait in women. Anonymous tracts published directly after the massacre accused her of using Machiavelli's The Prince as a textbook, corrupting her children, poisoning her way to the throne, using black magic to cure her infertility, and of course of planning the massacre itself. 17th and 18th century fiction used her as a vehicle for contemporary criticism, or as a foil to the sensible sedate queens the writers were implicitly or explicitly supporting, pressing the black legend as they went. Caravaglio, of course, went the alternate route and compared her to Marie Antoinette, emphasizing duplicity, religious persecution, and licentiousness, as did Marie Antoinette's prosecutors in 1793. Early 19th century French novelists frequently chose the Renaissance as a setting, just as fashion, art, and architecture drew influence from the Gothic and early modern periods. Honoré de Balzac and Alexandre Dumas took opposite political positions, but both depicted Catherine as cold, murderous, and scheming in characterizations that have been passed down to present day historical fiction. She became the ultimate wicked queen and bad example. Given Marie Antoinette's near mythical presence in pop culture, as well as the wildly popular Sofia Coppola movie artistically depicting her life, it's fair to say that her origins and story are well known. The 11th daughter and 15th child of the Holy Roman Emperor and Empress, the princess born Maria Antonia was married to the then Dauphin of France in 1770 at the age of 14 to seal the alliance between the two kingdoms. During her time as Dauphine, Marie Antoinette was conflictingly seen as a representative of the hated Austria and also a beautiful young princess, prompting both positive and negative reactions from her new people. After about four years of marriage, the Dauphin came to the throne with his still adolescent queen. The two did not have a child until 1778, a massive source of stress for Marie Antoinette, as it had been for Kathleen. By this time, the negative side of her perception was beginning to outweigh the positives. Scurrilous pamphlets known as libelles were commonly printed, alleging that she was engaging in sexual affairs with her male and female friends. 
But rather than being a simple venting of popular sentiment, these stories were fed to revolutionary writers and presses by the court faction opposed to Austrian interests or the Queen's interests specifically, and in fact helped to drive the negative public sentiment. French queens had traditionally been seen as inappropriate targets for such assaults, but the lack of an appropriate target, that is a royal mistress, led attention to be fixed upon her. The major difference between Marie Antoinette and Isabeau and Kathleen is that a strong sympathetic tradition sprang up even before her death. Edmund Burke's reactionary reflections on the revolution in France, published in 1790, described her as a persecuted woman, and the memoirs published by her lady-in-waiting, Henriette Campan in 1822, presented her as a noble and kind woman with innate dignity. The Bonaparte empresses Josephine and Eugenie were both fascinated by her, and fashion made frequent references to her. The Queen continued to be a popular figure for fiction and pop history, allowing writers and filmmakers to explore both the luxury and the tragic end of her life. But at the same time, she continued to be used as the perfect example of wealthy thoughtlessness. The assumptions that she did spend France into debt and that she did not care at all about the plight of the French poor frequently exist side by side with sympathy for the brutality and degradation of her death. She's still regularly used as a comparison for wealthy women who seem self-obsessed and completely unaware of the plight of the poor. In all three cases, I also have to note that the main flaws of the queen are reflected in popular stories about their relationship to clothing. Isabeau, supposed to be immoral, has been associated with gowns worn open to the stomach with pierced nipples on display. Kathleen, the queen associated with physical cruelty, has been accused of requiring her ladies in waiting to lace their stays down to 13 inch waists. Despite this being likely impossible with the materials used at the time, and certainly would take years of waist training in any case. And Marie Antoinette, of course, is highly associated with a gigantic, fashionable, expensive wardrobe and a desire to set trends, though she was largely following them. An obsession with clothing has long been a feminized trait, and in this case, the stories seem to have come from literally nowhere except the knowledge that these are women popularly assumed to be deviant. The elephant in the room when looking at all three of these queens is misogyny. There is no logical reason to believe Isabeau changed sides because she couldn't make up her mind that Kathleen de' Medici ordered the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, or that Marie Antoinette was single-handedly emptying the treasury. They only make sense when viewing events through a sexist prism. All of the claims against the reputations of these queens were well-established in the misogynist playbook. Thanks, Cassidy, for that paper. I look forward to hearing more of your thoughts in the discussion. Our next speaker is Dominic Webb. He graduated with a degree in history from the University of Warwick in 2019, where he focused on conservative resistance to Hitler. He also holds an MA in journalism. He'll be presenting his paper, Churchill's Angels, the Female Agents of SOE's F Section in Popular Memory and Culture. The girls who served as secret agents in Churchill's Special Operations Executive were young, beautiful, and brave. This quote from Marcus Binney's The Women Who Lived for Danger serves as a fitting introduction to this topic because it is only one third true. That the 39 women sent into occupied France by the Special Operations Executive were all brave is undeniable, that they're all young is untrue, and whether they were all beautiful is somewhat irrelevant. The Special Operations Executive was established in July 1940 and was famously assigned one task by Winston Churchill to set Europe ablaze. Over the course of the war, SOE agents operated from Singapore to Svalbard carrying out acts of sabotage, building and supporting resistance groups, and gathering intelligence. Almost 500 agents, male and female, were sent to France, responsibility for which was assigned to SOE's F section. These agents played a key role in building the resistance groups, which crippled the German response to D-Day by sabotaging French railways and harassing advancing German forces. There is a large corpus of novels and pop histories focusing on Britain's involvement in the Second World War as well as a significant back catalogue of TV shows, documentaries and films. Of the many aspects of Britain's war, its intelligence and clandestine operations, including those carried out by women, have garnered an especial interest. Many books, both fictional and non-fiction, have been written about women recruited by SOE and sent into action. However, in the words of leading SOE historian M.R.D. Foote, on these few, there is a large popular literature, almost all of it worthless and much of it about the wrong people. As some of the only women on the Western Front employed on the front line, or indeed beyond it, F section's female agents transgressed against traditional gendered expectations. Some left children behind, some husbands. Violette Tazavo, who had been widowed in 1942, left behind her young daughter when she was parachuted into France. When recruited, many of the women left roles doing what was considered to be traditional women's work. Virginia Hall, one of SOE's most famous agents, 
was working as a secretary in the US Embassy in London when she was recruited. Some 15 of the agents were recruited from the non-combat Women's Auxiliary Air Force. When they entered the field, these women continued to defy the gendered roles imposed upon them by SOE command. While women were only supposed to act as couriers and wireless operators, and were denied the opportunity to act as organizers and weapons and sabotage instructors, they nonetheless filled these roles when the situation demanded it. When the organizer she was working under was captured by the Gestapo shortly before D-Day, Pearl Witherington took command of the local armed resistance, ending up in command of as many as three and a half thousand men. Another female agent took over as her network's weapons instructor after the original was killed in a German ambush. Some women also broke the gendered combat taboo, engaging in direct armed conflict with the Germans. Nancy Wake's George Medal citation mentions one incident where, during a German attack, and I quote, Wake personally took command of a section of 10 men whose leader was demoralized. She led them to within point blank range, directed their fire, rescued two American officers and withdrew in good order. Although some writers have raised doubts regarding the incident, it is generally accepted that Violette Zazavo was involved in the generally masculine act of a heroic last stand. Having badly sprained her ankle, she held off pursuing SS soldiers with a submachine gun long enough to allow her travelling companion to escape. She was captured by the Germans and killed in Ravensbrück concentration camp. In popular memory and culture, however, these gendered expectations are reasserted upon the agents. The focus of many popular works is not on the actions and accomplishments of the agents, but on their sexual and romantic histories. SOE's female agents suffer heavily from the Bond girl view of female espionage, wherein female operatives have two purposes, to look pretty and die tragically. In both popular history and popular culture, female SOE agents are objectified and sexualized in a way that their male counterparts are not. One example of this is the popular understanding of Christina Scarbeck, also known as Christine Granville, who worked for both the Secret Intelligence Service and SOE. She was involved in cross-border intelligence work in Poland and Hungary, at one point being smuggled out of Hungary in the boot of the British minister's car in order to avoid arrest by the Gestapo. She joined SOE in 1944 and was sent into France where she served with distinction, on one occasion securing the release of three fellow SOE officers with a combination of threats of violence and considerable bribes. Granville is a notable case study because she had a series of love affairs throughout the war, which has subsequently become the focus of her reputation in popular culture. The most thorough and recent biography of her, written by Claire Mully, is entitled The Spy Who Loved, and descriptions of the book on a number of online bookstores trumpet Granville's Many Lovers. In the video game Hearts of Iron 4, players can recruit historical agents for their intelligence agencies, who were then assigned traits such as double agent or safecracker, which reflect their historical activities and skills. Alongside the commando trait, Granville is assigned the trait of seducer. Granville was murdered in 1952 by a violent stalker, and much ink has been spilled litigating the exact nature of her relationship with him, including whether or not it was sexual. The sexualization of female agents extends from popular history through to popular culture. One example of this is the French film Female Agents, which follows five female SOE agents as they attempt to extract a captured British officer with knowledge of the G-Day landings. Their first task is to rescue the officer from a convalescent hospital for injured German soldiers where he's being held. The agents decide that the only way to cause a sufficient distraction in order to smuggle the officer out of the hospital is to distract the soldiers with a sex show. In another scene, one of the agents takes a cyanide pill to prevent her from revealing any more information under torture. Before doing so, however, she first removes all of her clothes. The women in this film are objects, not agents. A second agent who has been the subject of special attention in popular culture is Noor Inayat Khan. Inayat Khan, whose father was Indian and mother American, and who grew up in France and Britain, was the only woman of colour sent into France by SOE. She arrived in Paris shortly before the network she was due to join was broken up by the secret police and survived for three months before she was betrayed, a considerable achievement given that the life expectancy of a wireless radio operator in occupied France was just six weeks. She was executed in Dachau concentration camp in 1944 and posthumously awarded the George Cross, one of Britain's highest awards for bravery. Inayat Khan is consistently orientalized in the popular imagination as an exotic spy princess. While there is that best spurious evidence that Inayat Khan ever claimed the title of princess, she is often given this title due to her family's royal ancestry. Her great, great, great grandfather was Tipu Sultan, who ruled the Kingdom of Mysore until 1719, when he was killed by the British East India Company during the siege of Seringapatam. Both her modern biography and a 2006 documentary bear the title The Spy Princess.
Leo Marx, who worked on SME codes and ciphers, called her a potty princess, while Morris Buckmaster, who headed F section, described her upbringing as mystical and her father as an Indian prince. Gendered imaginings are also reimposed upon Inayat Khan. In one fictionalized retelling of her life, she tells the story as a narrator in the form of letters to her unborn child. A second presents her, in the words of historian Jean Lahiri, as an erotic figure. The female agents of SOE's F section placed themselves in extraordinary danger during the war. Of the 39 women sent into France, 16 were arrested and imprisoned by the Nazis, of whom 13 did not return home. The women transgressed against the gendered expectations of society, and when in the fields, when the need arose, defied the gendered roles imposed upon them by SOE. Some women, such as Violette Zazalbo and Nancy Wake, even broke the combat taboo, engaging in direct armed combat against German soldiers. Modern popular memory and culture, however, reassert these gendered expectations upon them. What is considered noteworthy is not their contributions to the defeat of Nazism, but their sexual activities and romantic attractions. In short, they are not considered as agents in either sense of the word, but as mothers and lovers. Thanks for that great paper. That was really fascinating. I'm not a 20th century historian, but that just sounds really cool and makes me want to be one. So now for our final speaker, we have Annie Whitehead. She is an elected member of the Royal Historical Society and an award-winning author with several fiction and nonfiction publications, including To Be a Queen, Mercia, The Rise and Fall of a Kingdom, and Women of Power in Anglo-Saxon England. She will be presenting her paper, Kept in the Dark, What is the True Story of Women in Power in Pre-Conquest England? I was informed recently that Anglo-Saxon and medieval women had no choice in whom they wed, that all their goods belonged to their husbands or fathers, and that they were sent to nunneries as punishment, and once there, they could not escape. I was also told that this was because of the established patriarchy. Now, I can't speak about later periods, but this wasn't the case in Anglo-Saxon England, particularly not in the early part of the era, where we know that most religious houses were run by women, and Hild, abbess of Whitby, educated no fewer than five future bishops. Even so, the women of pre-conquest England have had a bad press, and many of the more salacious stories have endured. In this paper, I'm going to briefly address the issue of women's lot in general, and then look at how later chroniclers distorted the life stories of influential women. And I'm going to do that by focusing on four Anglo-Saxon women in particular. Pre-conquest law codes and documents, some dating as far back as the early 700s, show us that a woman could not be married against her will, and that any land given to her as part of the marriage agreement was hers to keep and bequeath as she saw fit. There were laws against rape, and widows were not to be consecrated as nuns too hastily, and if they were unmarried after 12 months, could choose their own future. Many, incidentally, chose the religious life. It was far from unpleasant. One note of caution to be sounded here. If laws were deemed necessary, it might suggest that these principles were being disregarded. Nevertheless, the laws were there. Let me turn now, though, to specific women of power. And I'd hazard a guess that most people have heard of Lady Godiva. I'd even go so far as to say that she's the most famous of all Anglo-Saxon women, taking up her husband's dare to ride naked through the streets of Coventry if she wished him to lower taxes. But is the story true? Entries in the contemporary Anglo-Saxon chronicle of events of the 11th century are full of detail, yet there is nothing within its pages about this incident. Only Roger of Wendover, a later Anglo-Norman chronicler, has the story. My research has shown the likelihood that the monastery at Coventry was founded jointly by Godiva and her husband on land that she owned, and that he was a shrewd, rather staid man, unlikely to dare his wife to ride naked. There's no clear indication why Roger chose to portray Godiva in this way, though he might have been referencing folk tales linked to a pagan god of ladies riding on white horses. But I have some ideas why the good names of the next two women were besmirched. Eighth century King Offa of Mercia was, at the height of his powers, overlord of all the kingdoms in England south of the River Humber. An East Anglian king was visiting Mercia, specifically seeking the hand of one of Offa's daughters. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records merely that Offa had this king beheaded, but typically the later chroniclers embellished this story. The 12th century chronicle of John of Worcester says that he was slain by the wicked urging of Offa's wife, Cunnethrith. Roger of Wendover, him again, relates how the queen arranged for a pit to be dug underneath a seat where their guest would sit, 
the victim was plunged into the pit and stifled by the Queen's executioners. Cunnethrith, in fact, not only attested charters, but notably she attested during the reign of her son, Edgefrith, even appearing in charters without him before he reached his majority, after which he seems to have replaced her on the witness list. So it seems the case can be made that she was acting as regent. She was also the only known queen, not just of Mercia, but anywhere in England to have coins struck in her name. Contemporary letters from Alcuin, advisor to the Empress Charlemagne, no less, exhort her son to learn authority from his father and compassion from his mother. He would have written to her himself, he said, but he knew the king's business kept her too busy to read letters. So why the murder accusation? The double monasteries, housing men and women and usually run by an often royal abbess, began to decline during the 8th century, perhaps in part because as royal endowments they were becoming too rich and too powerful. Mercian kings claiming monastic land as hereditary property ruffled the feathers of the churchmen. Offa built up quite the property portfolio, naming his wife as his heir. She became abbess of Cookham, but the Archbishop of Canterbury claimed the rights to it, and Cunnethrith had to enter into an agreement whereby in order to keep Cookham, she had to give away another monastery and a number of large estates attached to it. Is there a clue here? Another Mercian royal abbess, Quenthrith, was accused by the Anglo-Norman chronicler William of Malmesbury of arranging for her young brother, who'd been named king when their father died, to be murdered and the body hidden. The story goes that a dove flew over the altar at St Peter's in Rome and dropped a message saying where the body was. When it was brought back for burial, fearing discovery, Quentrith chanted a psalm backwards as a spell and her eyes spontaneously fell out. Malmesbury said there were still bloodstains on the Psalter even in his day. And the problem with this is that Quentrith's brother probably didn't even exist. A man by a similar name witnessed charters, but those charters are considered spurious. Claiming to own a martyred royal saint's relics was always useful for monasteries, and it may be that Winchcombe, where he was supposedly buried, gained prestige through this story. In addition, it should be noted that, like the wife of Offa, Quenthrith was a powerful abbess who, after judgments at ecclesiastical councils in the 820s, had to relinquish control of some of her most lucrative abbeys to the church at Canterbury. The by now familiar trope of royal murderesses continued in the 10th century with Elfthrith, the last wife of King Edgar. Various Anglo-Norman chroniclers tell us that she practiced witchcraft, connived to murder a bishop by having him stabbed under the armpits where the wounds would not show, of being complicit in the murder of her first husband, of bewitching Edgar, her second, and of arranging the murder of her stepson. However, we should lay these lurid claims against more contemporary evidence. It was during Edgar's reign that the Benedictine monastic reform gathered momentum, and when Bishop Athelwald produced his Regularis Concordia, laying out the rules for monastic life, he mentioned Elthrith by name, saying that she should defend communities of nuns like a fearless sentinel. The near contemporary Britforth of Ramsey described Edgar's coronation feast saying, the queen loftily surpassed the other ladies present with a regal bearing that was befitting to her since she'd been found worthy to marry the king. This is important because this is taken from the life of St Oswald who opposed the queen and her son after the king's death. And even so, the account is favorable. Elfrith was a consecrated queen for that was also her coronation. She attested charters and was remembered as a forespriaca, advocate, speaking on behalf of women in legal disputes. A letter explains how a woman named Wolfie rode to me at Coombe looking for me. The me in question is Elfrith, and she goes on to describe how she interceded and helped bring a land dispute involving Wolfie to a conclusion. Like Offa's wife, she was also regent for her son during his minority, influential even after his first marriage, and was credited with bringing up her grandson. Far from being pawns, chattels, or any other stereotype, these women were influential. Bede tells us of the wife of Redwald, King of East Anglia in the seventh century, who, when told of his conversion, seduced him into returning to his heathen practices. She must have been persuasive indeed if she managed to change his mind after his visit to the strongly Christian kingdom of Kent had convinced him of the benefits of conversion. The wife of Redwald's sometime ally, the King of Northumbria, was sent letters and personal gifts by the Pope, who exhorted her to evangelize and persuade her husband to convert to Christianity. 
And this is another thing which strikes at the heart of the misrepresentation of these women by later chroniclers. Clearly the Pope thought well enough of this woman to write such letters. And not only is there no contemporary reference to naked horse rides or fratricide, there is a great deal of evidence for literacy. We've already heard of letters sent by Alcuin and by the Pope. We might assume that these were read out to the recipients, but I think that, especially in the case of the women running large monastic estates, the ability to read would have been crucial. We know that a 7th century Queen of Kent could read because a contemporary source tells us so. We have 9th century Asser's confirmation that Alfred the Great and his siblings were educated, that Alfred's mother was literate, and in fact it was she who taught Alfred to read. Another surviving and important document is the will left by a 10th century lady, who, as well as disposing of several estates, jewellery and furniture, bequeathed a number of books. It's hard to believe that she would have kept books, and we needn't assume they were all religious texts, unless she herself could read them. A contemporary of Godiva, Queen Emma, was wife of first King Ethelred the Unready and then King Canute. During her fight for her son's right to the English throne, she commissioned a work of propaganda called the Encomium Emma Regine. It's likely that, as a commissioner of a radical piece telling a woman's story, Emma would have wanted to read it herself, and thus we might assume that she too was literate. Of course, in these times, there was a distinction between being able to read and able to write, and I'm not suggesting these noble women could do the latter. But just recently, a 10th century skeleton, nicknamed the Bluetoothed Nun, was revealed to have those blue teeth because the woman had a habit of licking her paintbrush as she decorated illuminated texts. Time, I think, to revise old notions of these pre-conquest women's abilities, power, and influence. Thank you. Thanks for that final paper. That really pulled together a lot of themes that we had throughout this panel. And I'm excited how well they came together. So to kick off this roundtable conversation, I'm curious if you could all take this question and address the challenges of finding women in primary sources, and especially with the thread of fiction that we have in this panel, I'm curious how historical imagination and creativity can help reconstruct these deleted and missing stories. There are actually very few mentions of women by name in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, but it is possible by cross-referencing to track these women's stories down and Though I have denigrated them, the Anglo-Norman chroniclers are very useful in that regard because they do give us the stories, salacious though they are, and then I can sort of backtrack to find out the, the truth behind these myths and legends. Um, in terms of fiction, the, the constant use of the word why is really important for me. And um, just one example, alongside the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, we have a, a small section of it called the Mercian Register, which is a surviving fragment of a much longer chronicle. And it basically tells the Mercian story and particularly that of Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians. And it chronicles the, well, the bit we have left, chronicles the years when she was in charge of Mercia, when her husband was ill and then subsequently when he died. And what's interesting for me is that um, the early part of that, when he was ill, Yes, her activities are chronicled and she's building fortified towns and she's sending armies to fight the Vikings, but she's not straying very far from home. And when I was developing her fictional character, I was thinking, well, perhaps she was just staying at home nursing him. And that to me then spoke about their relationship, that she didn't want to go too far away, you know, while he was ill and before he died. It's, it's not something so interesting that historians would put in a history book, but developing a fictional character just thinking about that gave me the chance to develop and just put that little bit of her story back in. I think I would probably say that I've got the opposite problem to Annie here, which is the curse of the modern historian, that there's probably too many primary sources. So um, with SOE, there's kind of two big blocks of primary sources, which are often in opposition to each other. So you've got the official SOE documents, the archives, and then you have the primary sources of the agents themselves and the resistance fighters. And there's kind of almost a time split between them because directly after the war, everything's still classified on the official side. But then you have all these agents who are telling their stories. They're writing books, they're appearing in films. And then when the archives actually start to be opened, which is not for another maybe 30 or 40 years, actually it turns out that a lot of the things that they were saying is untrue. So there's a really good example of this, um, which is a woman called Elizabeth Clark, who 
was never an SOE agent and completely made up her account. And she has a, a very striking anecdote of she looked the wrong way when she first got to France and was trying to cross the road and got arrested because there was an, a police officer who was watching and saw her look the wrong way, almost get run over and arrested her. And then that made its way into a memoir by Maurice Buckmaster, who was the head of F section. Um, and then that got picked up by the official history of SOE because he'd seen it in the memoir. And then when you actually look at the primary documents, nobody who was captured was captured like that. And so there's this big tension between the people who were there and the official documents, which sometimes contradict each other. But then also because the official documents, they were the other side of the channel. They didn't have the best idea what was going on. Sometimes they're wrong and the people's recollections are right. And so there's this really interesting tension between what people are saying about themselves and what happens when you actually look at the documents, which actually makes it very difficult to try and reconstruct what actually happened. And you have to make a very difficult value judgment between the two. So from my perspective, um, I don't actually use that many primary sources myself. I am you know, not an academic historian and I tend to focus on early modern and then sort of the beginnings of modern history. And um, definitely in that period, I am more like Dom's problem where you have a lot of primary sources that I see referenced in my text. And it makes it really stand out to me when I do see people argue that for these some of these periods in you know, early modern forward, it's hard to find women in the primary sources because especially with noble women and queens, I mean, they wrote correspondence, they were involved in land transactions and you know, legal proceedings and church related things all, all the time. And it's, it's more about taking those seriously as, as things they were doing rather than sort of dismissing them as, as like women's work almost, which is something that I do kind of see from time to time. Yeah, like I said, I don't really, I don't really use that many primary sources myself um because most of the people I read about there's there's a lot of secondary sources about them <laughs> I don't know if I should admit that I think that's interesting what you bring up the idea that things get dismissed as women's work and here on this women's history panel we have political and military history which has often been considered separate or written about separately but here you're doing all of that together so I think that's really interesting and shows just how the field is changing, that it's not separate spheres, women are in the home, men are doing politics, but that these are worlds that are combined and interacting. So could you all talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly for me, um, the inclusion of, of women, if we put their stories back into history, it actually gives us a much more rounded and nuanced picture of what's going on and a better understanding of the societal composition because I think the, the assumption tends to be, and it's not entirely untrue, but that um, Anglo-Saxon England, you, various kingdoms always at war, these are warlords, they're constantly going to battle. And like I say, that's not untrue, but when we put the women's stories back in, um, as I said um, earlier, then we find that, you know, the, the women who are in positions of power, they are, not necessarily uh, taking swords and leading armies, but they are influencing decisions, be it by whispering in the king's ear or through diplomacy. A lot of them uh, were so-called peace weavers um, sent to marry kings in other kingdoms, supposedly to bind the kingdoms together through marriage alliance. And I'm not sure they had an awful lot of say in that, but they worked really hard. I mean, the, the queen that I mentioned who was sent letters by the Pope she was originally sent hundreds of miles away as a peace weaver bride, but clearly she worked her influence and uh, the whole country did eventually convert, well, I say eventually, quite soon after she arrived, converted to Christianity and she was credited with that. Uh, Queen Emma, who commissioned this wonderful, what I call the first work of spin. It was incredibly one-sided, it was incredibly biased, it was a work of pure propaganda, but she was, you know, that was her fight. And, and through that, she was successful in helping her son gain the throne. So put the women's stories back in and you see something beyond just sword 
fighting and battles, there's a lot of diplomacy, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. And yeah, as Cassidy said, they're not simply doing women's work, they're doing the men of power's work, but in a slightly different and perhaps more subtle way. So it's, it's good to have their stories back in, I think. I don't know what I can really say because you really said it. Um, that the, the framing of this way to me, I mean, it, it shows how much more agency they had and, and competence and ability than has traditionally been ascribed to queens and um, who are sort of seen as, you know, women who look good and, and bear children. And if they don't do that, then, you know, they have no value uh, to the, you know, important men involved. But there, there really is so much more than that. Yeah, I think likewise, it's a really good point about you have to put the women's stories back in to help you understand the overall context because with the SOE agents, if you just take them out of their context and study what they were doing at one time, you lose the overall story of what was going on because these are intelligence networks. It's not just one person going in and doing things. They're cooperating with the broad range of other agents of resistance members. So if you take Nora Nia Khan, for example, for three months, she was the only radio operator in Paris. So she was potentially the most wanted person in France for three months. And you don't tell the story of the British led resistance networks in Paris without including that. And so it's absolutely vital to consider these people in context. And if you just take them out and treat them as their own little subset of history, you kind of lose their effects on the overall um, overall war. Like that's really interesting. And I wrote down during your presentation that quick quote, objects, not agents. Because I think it's really interesting that you're giving them agency by making them agents again and taking away from those fictional stories that sexualize and romanticize. And I think it's striking that Cassidy also mentioned the dressing of women in these stories too that sexualizes them and changes their morality. So I think the fact that we have these two different chronologies, we have the queens and spies that both have these different forms of sexualization in fiction is a unique thread across this pretty wide time span. So I wonder what other similarities and comparisons you can make with all this. Um, I think for me that the similarities are simply finding those stories and then once you found them cutting through the bias I, I think it's it really quite that simple um, the differences I think are um, for me that the paucity of sources it makes it a real struggle um, so when I do find them it's a question of combing through them looking for the tiniest little detail squeezing out every drop of information but I think ultimately it, it is a common thread that, you know, you've got to find these stories first off and then you've got to sift through what has been written to decide, you know, why was it written and how much of it was true. And I, I think that's universal across the, the whole chronology. Something that stood out to me in all of our papers um, is how it's, in, each, in each of these settings, you know, the women are being allowed or even encouraged to have this agency and to do these jobs. Um, and it's really like afterward or from people who are far removed from it, who are judging them the most really, which I, I don't know what to, where to go with that, but it's very interesting how this you know, persists through the centuries that we're spanning here. Yeah, definitely. In terms of the people who are removed from the situation judging them, if you look at SOE, they recognised that actually for the roles which the women were playing, female agents were actually better suited for these roles because they were less likely to get taken away for forced labour, the Germans were less suspicious of them, and so they could travel a lot more easily. And then after the war, when it comes out that they've been using these female agents, there's all sorts of sensationalist news headlines. It's like, oh, they sent women to be spies? Goodness me. From these people who were actually removed from the operational almost necessity of doing this and I don't know if that's the same for the queens that actually the people who were doing these things with them who were learning from the Anglo-Saxon abbesses whether they're actually accepting those roles and then as time goes on you get people who say goodness me 
why was that going on? Why were they allowed to do that? I, I, I definitely think there is an element of that. And I think, it's, as I said, very early on, um, the, the abbesses were playing a huge role. And I think that changed. I mean, the Anglo-Norman chroniclers, obviously, they, they came in after the Norman conquest. They had no reason to lionise any of the Anglo-Saxon history. But I, I think the women particularly, I, I think by then the church had changed. And monasteries were hugely, hugely jealous. I mean, they, these were huge sort of business estates, almost very, very lucrative. And they, they weren't unknown they, to forge documents showing that they really had the rights to these lands and these monasteries. And so the fact that these women were very, very powerful and a lot of the ones that I mentioned, you know, they, they did lock horns with the church and the establishment at the time. But I think it was given a, a worse spin by the later chroniclers who had everything to gain and you know, no reason to to write about these women in any particular pleasant way, because they were in charge now, and the, the men essentially were running the church. And I think that's that's a huge part of it, um, that where you see these women accused of, of murder, by and large, they they did have some kind of tussle with the church. That you know, they were also um, a lot of them were regents, you know, and they perhaps. I uh, remember Cassidy saying, you know, that, that ambitious women, you, you can't be a woman and ambition, you know, and have ambition. And I, I think that's a huge part of it as well. That, and with the, the women of the SOE, you know, these women are all stepping out of their expected traditional roles. It's accepted at the time, but then looking back, and if you're looking for a scapegoat for anything, they seem to be the ideal candidates. I, don't, I think that's part of it as well. There's one question I have for Annie and as well I don't know if you've written much fiction but with a lot of the very very bad fiction that I read when I was researching this paper um, there's a pretty common thread that there's this very present threat of being arrested by the Germans and obviously that was a real threat but slightly less pressing than it appears in literature and for me that seems like there has to be this tension in fiction that there's not in actually retelling these stories so I was wondering whether as writers of fiction you think that there is this conflict between telling a good story which is interesting and compelling and also telling a story which is kind of grounded in the historical reality yeah for me it's a um, really good question actually uh, and I hear a lot people say oh history tells us what happened and fiction tells us why and I don't 100% agree with that because I think any historian should be analysing and, and working out why things happened and not just telling a, a narrative history. Um, but in terms of fiction, I mean, I write about real characters. Um, I don't make any of them up. Even when servants are, are named, I, I use those as characters in my books. Um, so I feel I have a duty to tell their stories pretty accurately. And uh, I don't mess around with, with timelines where they're known. And I think that the fiction writer has carte blanche to fill in the gaps of the known history, uh, but to make it plausible. But where those gaps are being filled in, that's the opportunity to flesh out the characters, uh, you know, to put the flesh on the bones, think about their relationships with their families, with their enemies, the dynamics, the interaction. Um, but I think in terms of you know, telling a, a compelling narrative, I think the trick is to know when to start and when to stop. And that might not be, if you're, if you're telling the, the life story of someone, that might not be to start with their birth and end with their death. You've got to think about a sort of narrative arc and also think about what to leave out. Because if you've got people sitting around a, a meeting, you know, in Churchill's war room, you don't necessarily need to mention everybody who was there. Just make sure that you are true to the stories of the people you are telling. So you, you need to select the bits of history. You need to make sure that, you know, pick the best bits, but make sure that's true. That's the way I look at it. I know a lot of people like to, to mess around with timelines and, and drop fictional characters in, but that's, that's not what I do. Perhaps because of my training as a historian, I don't know. But if I know something happened, I'll either ignore it or I'll add it in. But I, what I won't do is, is bend the facts where they're known. Um, I think one of the troubles that a lot of people have, because I've read a lot of novels about historical queens, um, they're very popular to write, um, especially early modern and early modern ones, is that 
you know, people aren't necessarily uh, plugged into like the most recent scholarship that, you know, shows all of the agency and, you know, legal proceedings and all kinds of, you know, regencies and things that Queens were doing. And so there's a tendency, like you kind of mentioned, Dom, about um, needing conflict and so on. And so they do go with the sort of traditional stereotypical conflict of, you know, oh, there's a mistress at court and, you know, I don't like her and that sort of thing, or, you know, just sort of generalized patriarchal oppression. And so there's a lot out there that I think people sometimes don't realize that they could be using as, as you know, factional conflict at the court or something where, yeah, people just accept, of course, the queen is involved in politics to some degree. And, you know, she's writing letters to the Pope and so on, but there's, there's just not that um, familiarity it's it's still very uh, much a in you know an academic press sort of situation where people aren't getting it maybe from most of their pop history yeah I, I think that's a really interesting thread the kind of people who consume popular culture aren't necessarily up to date with the kind of cutting edge of research so for example there's an otherwise very good film called a call to spy which looks at the story of virginia hall and nor any khan and there's a lot of kind of technical details it gets wrong so they're using the wrong kind of explosives. They set up the clandestine landings wrong. And I think it's very interesting to look at this sense of authenticity versus sense of accuracy. So what, when you're writing fiction or when you're making a film, what will feel right to the reader who doesn't necessarily have the greatest understanding and what is actually accurate? Yeah, so I've got a question for, for Cassidy, actually. Um, and interesting to hear Dom's views as well. Um, the, the famous line that, you know, you're talking about the, the, the popular understanding of history and that not everybody's necessarily up to date with uh, all the recent scholarship. And I suppose the one thing that most people know or think they know about Marie Antoinette is the let them eat cake quotation. <laughs> and I was thinking about this and obviously with, with my Lady Godiva, the thing, only thing people think they know is that she took off all her clothes and rode on a horse. Um, and I can't think of many other male examples. I mean, King Alfred, yeah, we know he burnt the cakes. It's probably not true. But we also tend to know that he fought the Vikings. But with Marie Antoinette, um, let them eat cake and they chopped her head off. And I'm just wondering um, what you think, Cassidy, is, is why more of her story isn't popularly or generally known um, I mean, I, I actually learned a lot listening to what you said about her that you, I didn't know that much. So I'm just wondering what, what you think has, has stopped people from, from learning about that or has the story actually been suppressed over the years? I think probably the biggest factor is just that that stereotype is so set in stone that people who aren't sort of, you know, attracted to the romanticism of it all um, are, are put off a bit from, you know, from looking farther because they're like, ah, you know, she just, she didn't care about the poor. She was just obsessed with her clothes and so on. So I don't know if I would say suppressed because that implies like a more deliberate sort of thing. But on the other hand, I mean, it was kind of deliberate by the revolutionaries, you know, who were presenting her at her trial as, you know, someone who's like coll the colluding with Austria and, you know, abusing her son and so on, so that it makes it, it puts a bar to, to sort of identifying more closely and, and finding her more sympathetic and looking it for, you know, other, other things about her life. Yeah, there's a certain amount of uh, sensationalism there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, and Dom, I just wanted to ask you, why is it, do you think that the, the women of the SOE are still thought of in terms of, of being so out of the ordinary that there, there seems to be this shock almost that, that women could possibly behave like that and so therefore you know as you were saying the, the the idea that we have to talk about a woman had so many lovers she couldn't just have been a very good and competent agent I'm just wondering why these typical female attributes are always attached to these stories and that we don't just see them as as, as doing what they did as a job um, just wondered on your thoughts on that. Um, well, I think Ian Fleming has a lot to answer for here. Um, <laughs> even even though he should have known better because he was involved in naval intelligence during the war. So I think because James Bond is such a cultural titan, 
that a lot of people think female spy bond girl that's kind of inextricably linked and because of the way that bond girls are expected to behave they're expected to be beautiful they sleep with james bond quite a lot there's kind of that trope which i think is very difficult to get past but in terms of soe in popular culture it's not necessarily always been that way so directly after the war a lot of the films and the books were made in consultation with the agents uh, and there was even one film which actually cast soe agents as the main characters it wasn't a very good film because they weren't very good actors but they were still very directly involved but now as time moves on and some of the agents well most of the agents i think by this point have actually passed away the gap between the subject and the author the source and the writer is much wider and so they end up relying a lot more on kind of familiar established tropes and especially if you're an author who's got to journal a book every other year you don't have that time to do this very in-depth research to actually reconstruct this accurate picture and so a lot of them do tend to fall back upon these established tropes and cliches which actually as we've seen don't really apply to women in reality um dom i was wondering is do you do you see um like a connection between how the soe women are, are sort of treated after the war with how women who are serving in uh, the more, I don't know, I never know what the word is for this, like auxiliary roles in, you know, other divisions were treated or, or viewed? Yeah, I mean, there's, after the war, there's this massive demobilization because Britain for the past six years has spent its entire focus towards defeating Germany and the other Axis powers. And then once the war ends, they've suddenly got this huge army, all these women have been mobilized into the factories, into the auxiliary services but then they need to demobilize and so soe immediately after the war just gets abolished and all of these women um with the notable exception of virginia hall who ends up joining the cia more or less go back to their normal lives they don't continue as spies and so i think that's reflected across wider society that actually the women have done their bit for the war but then we don't necessarily see that sticking on permanently in huge changes and obviously the fact that they had done this does lead to a realignment of opinion, but it's not this sudden six year change that then everything's absolutely different. There's a lot of societal structures kind of reasserting themselves after the war because the war is so extraordinary that after it's over, society kind of almost wants to go back to normal. It doesn't want to keep um, continue on with all of the changes that happened to society during the war. And I, I don't know if that's similar for any of the other huge realignments that are in your two's um, areas. So like the French Revolution, are there kind of lasting changes when the Vikings come? Is that something which really fundamentally alters things? I think for me, definitely, I've, I've often said this, that I think a complete line was drawn through history in 1066. Um, I mean, the Normans did keep a lot of the English administrative systems in place because they worked. Um, it was a really, really well organized country. There's no doubt about that. Um, central and local government was very, very efficient. But beyond that, I mean, the whole top tier of, uh, you know, the, the, the nobles, the nobility were removed, destroyed, um, supplanted. And obviously the Normans, different culture and different language. And everything changed. And I think that their attitudes to women, I mean, I'm not an expert by any manner of means on uh, Norman attitudes to women, um, but I think they were different. I think they were less forgiving of their women folk, shall we say. And obviously the, this huge line and then history is written by the victors. So that's another thing that we need to factor into the mix. And I think, yes, the, the, the few women that did stand out as, as having achieved something, by and large, were not mentioned in favourable terms, um, with the exception of one, Athelflaed Lady of the Mercians, Henry of Huntingdon, uh, got rather smitten with her, and he, he wrote a poem, I don't know if I've said this already, um, comparing her achievements to Caesar. But that's a one-off. And generally speaking, I think these, these women who dared to, to step out of their roles, the later chroniclers not really interested, just concentrating always on the salacious stories. Um, and I 
I do wonder whether that's something, I mean, you, you were talking, Dom, about, you know, these, these women almost being objectified um, rather than just being, you know, lauded for what they did. And, and Cassidy, you know, you're saying that, you know, Catherine de Medici, there's so much more to her than, than what history sort of has allowed us to, to learn about her. And I do wonder whether there, it isn't just this whole, you know, the, the Madonna Hall thing, you know, that, that women should be doing one thing or if they're doing another, we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll tell these salacious stories, but we, we won't allow them any kind of freedom of choice. Um, you know, that women are very much good or bad and, and framed always in, in those really sort of narrow terms but yes yeah, certainly I, I think a huge line was was cut across England literally I mean you know the, the north was was burnt the harrowing of the north um, but also in terms of, of language culture literature everything so they they suddenly became one step removed the Anglo-Saxons you know although we we still speak a version of their language today they, they very much were pushed into the into the past and and left to stay there really I think you see the same kind of line drawing with the French Revolution and the American Revolution, really, where at the beginning of the French Revolution, you have these proto-feminists, you have, um, you know, ideas for laws that that are, you know, to form equality for the sexes. And then by the end of them, um, by, you know, the early 19th century, uh, 1800s, 18 teens, this huge emphasis on, you know, women in the home and Republican motherhood and, you know, women are, do best, they need to be educated so that they can educate their sons to become good citizens of the Republic, that sort of thing. It's, it's very similar to the idea of everybody wanting desperately to go back to normal at the end of World War II. And, you know, let's, let's make the gender roles even more defined just to make sure everything's okay. And that's the beginning of, you know, what we always call the cult of domesticity to that, that time period, you know, getting more and more refined and, you know, oh no, you, you've got to stay in the parlor and, you know, do any one of your million little needlework, uh, netting, painting screens, all these kinds of accomplishment projects uh, rather than, you know, the things that women were doing uh, in the 1780s and 90s writing things writing, you know, revolutionary pamphlets, like that historian who wrote The Crimes of the Queens of France, you know, no more of that. So we're starting to run out the clock. So I'm going to ask one final question before we move on to any closing statements. So to wrap up, my last question is noting that these women that we're all talking about are in very sensational and extraordinary stories. How does the history of these women tell us anything else about womanhood and gender beyond these select elites and these very few women that we're able to find in the record, but we can tell something about the broader social and cultural understanding of womanhood? I mean, one really quite interesting thing, which I don't think anyone has actually ever written about, is that secret agents, um, they take part in passing. So a secret agent has to fit in completely, absolutely. They have to be above suspicion. There's got to be no possibility that anyone can say, oh, that's odd, that's out of place, why are you doing that? And so the way that the cover identities of, the, of these agents were constructed is actually a really good way of looking at what the stereotypical French woman was supposed to be like. So if you're an agent who's going to be sent to Paris to be a middle-class woman, then someone has to sit down and think, right, what's this woman going to wear? What are their spare time activities going to be? So they're above suspicion. They're not suspiciously idle. What are they going to have in their pockets? And so for material culture, for kind of societal culture, it's really interesting to look at how these women passed in France, even while they were transgressing against the kind of established ideals of femininity and womanhood. I think for me, one one lady I didn't mention in, in my actual paper, but I've mentioned her a couple of times and I've written an awful lot about her as Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians. Um, she, the only real information that we've got telling her side comes from the, the Mercian register that I mentioned earlier. Um, in the main Anglo-Saxon chronicle, she's only ever mentioned as uh, King Edward of Wessex's sister. They, they don't even give her name. 
But what's interesting for me, and it's a tiny little thing that I can pull out attitudes to women in general, is the fact that though she led a kingdom in a time of war, not all the sources mentioned her name, but neither did they say that this was anything unusual. And it's clear that all the men of Mercia were happy to be led by this woman. They didn't put forward an alternative candidate. They got very, very upset when her daughter was deprived, of, of their words, deprived of all authority. Um, so they were happy for a, a daughter to succeed her mother, which didn't happen in this country again until Tudor times, um, where a woman succeeded a woman, not even a mother and daughter. Um, so I think that that one tiny aspect, yes, she's a noble woman, but it, it speaks volumes about the attitudes that actually, if if more women had been willing or able to come forward, clearly there was there was no bar to them ruling, and particularly in times of war. So for me, that's that's really telling about general attitudes. Uh, with mine, I I really see it as sort of the same the same things that happened to the queens happen to other women on a much smaller scale on um, the same kinds of attacks to your reputation you know where Catherine de medici was was attacked as being cruel because look she orchestrated this huge massacre maybe a woman in a neighborhood feud would be attacked for you know she was cruel to her servants when maybe she wasn't but it was a good way to get at her and of course sexuality is you know very much something that women at all levels of society could be attacked through um you know women would be taken to court because they said that their neighbor was you know a prostitute or something like that it's so it's it definitely speaks to what women up and down the social scale were facing um just through national feuds rather than neighborhood ones and that's a wrap on our discussion. That was great. I learned a lot. I hope everyone watching learned a lot. This was really fantastic. And I'll give you all a moment to say any closing thoughts or final words. This was a really great experience. And I loved being able to talk to Annie and Dom at the same time. It's very cool that our papers spoke to each other as they did. I have to thank our you know, backstage crew for making this panel. They did a good job. Just at the end, I wanted to read out the names of the 13 women who went into France and were killed by the Germans. Uh, so Yolande Beekman, Denise Bloch, André Borel, Muriel Bick, Madeleine Damamont, Noor Iniak Khan, Cecily Lefort, Pira Lee, Sonia Olszewski, Elaine Plumen, Lillian Rolfe, Diana Ryden, Yvonne Rudelatz, and, Il and Violette Zabo. Um, and I just want to say that if you're doing fiction, do it well. Uh, I just want to echo what the others have said. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dan, and to all the organisers. It's been a wonderful opportunity. It's been lovely to chat to, to Cassidy and to Dom. Um, it's been a real thrill for me, um, but also a little bit of a, a sadness in a way that I've been talking about trying to find the truth about women's stories from over a thousand years ago and the struggles with that to bring their stories back into the spotlight. Um, and it's been great to chat about all these universal themes and similar problems that we encounter, but maybe leaves me feeling a little bit sad too that um, it's not a problem just associated with the women who lived so very many long years ago. But the, the whole um, topic of this discussion has been great and to be able to have this opportunity to bring all these women's stories back out into the spotlight and um, dust them off and make them shine has just been wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Cassidy, Dominic, and Annie for presenting today. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to our organizers and our conference chair, Lisa. Everyone, please remember to check out the rest of our programming and come back to ask a story and to ask the questions that you come up with with it.